chicken scratch is only getting worse as time progresses. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I think it's under ten. That's what we told you. Chapter ten, number thirteen. No, nope, other way around. Chapter thirteen, number ten. Yes, there it is. Okay, the helium balloon problem, right? Yes, sir. Um, let's see. Okay, so basically the helium balloon problem is basically just uh, a pendulum that's upside down. Okay. Um, give me, uh, what? Let's do it this way. Um, with a regular pendulum, what are the forces on it? Um, the force of gravity and uh, tension, the force. And uh, I want to say that's it, because then it's just a centripetal once it gets going, I think. Yep, yep, you're right. Uh, yeah. So and the, and the tension supplies the centripetal force. But these are the right. only two forces in the sum of the forces. You're exactly right. Okay. And um, so in this case, tension has to overcome gravity. And right. through a lot of derivations and stuff that we're not going to do, we can get out of this that the period of oscillation is 2 pi square root L over G, right? Uh, I believe Isn't that the right equation? I printed all of these things out so I could make my life easier, but then I set them someplace and can't put my hands on them and anything. <laughs> For a swing, it is 2 pi over G, times the square root of L over G. Yeah. Good, good. Okay, now <clears throat> let's talk about a weird way to get this G for just a minute. Okay. I mean, you know, I know. We're talking about 9.81. Yeah. But let's put that aside for just a minute. And remember that the force of gravity, that's this thing here, is mass times gravity. And so what we can do here is we can get G by dividing both sides by M. And I'm going to call this the force of gravity divided by m, because that's what it is. Okay. okay. And so if we really wanted to, we could take this here and get rid of that g and insert this instead of that, if we wanted to. I'm not saying we do. Okay. Does that kind of make sense? It does. It's a weird way to do it, and, and this was just an aside, and I'll get to the problem in a second. But does this make sense? Yes, because it's mass times gravity to get the force of gravity. If you just divide the force of gravity by gravity or mass, whichever, to get the other one. There you it's go. Mass. Yep. Okay. 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 Whatever it has. Buoyancy, yeah, yeah. The force of buoyancy. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You got a tension in the string. Yep. You got gravity. Tension and gravity. And um, do you have two types of it, or is it just one gravity? Because well, I've got the force of gravity pulling it down and tension pulling it down as well. 
Right. I just don't know if like you include the gravity of the helium in the balloon or if you Yeah, that'd be the gravity of the helium and the, the rubber balloon. So that's supposed to be just together. Yes, so, correct. Okay. Um, I don't know when it's supposed to separate them versus when they're just like one thing. Uh, it doesn't say anything about the, the envelope of the balloon having a weight, so does it say anything about it? I don't see anything. It says a balloon. Oh, there it is, a light balloon. <laughs> what does that mean? I, I wish I knew, because they're all pretty light if they float. So. <laughs> what it means, it's, it's using tricky language. It's saying that uh, a light balloon means that the, the, the rubber envelope doesn't really weigh anything. Okay. So don't, you don't have to worry about the weight. The only thing you have to worry about here is the weight of the helium itself. Okay. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> now let's go back to this one for just a minute here. For this one, because we can say sum of the forces equals zero, and that would be tension minus force of gravity equals zero. We can add this force of gravity over here and say tension equals force of gravity. Right? Right. Okay, so now let's do that on this one. Some of the forces equals zero. What are our forces? Forces are tension, force okay. of gravity, and um, force of movement. Yes. And these two are negative because they're going down, and this one's going up, right? Mm -hmm. Now let's solve this for T. So I'm going to just add the T to the other side, so I get T equals the force of buoyancy minus the force of gravity. Okay. Right? Does that make sense? It does. I just. When I set it up, I put it backwards because the force of obedience is negative in that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just arrange it so you get tension by itself. Right. Now, here's what I'm doing. I'm setting up a picture here so that these two pictures are the same thing but flip-flopped. Okay. So if you look at this, with this problem, tension is caused by the force of gravity. And you can use that force of gravity divided by mass to get gravity that is the thing that goes underneath the L. Mm -hmm. Let's do that over here. Tension is this caused by these two things. If we take force of gravity minus the force of buoyancy, uh, the other way around, I'm sorry. Hold on. Force of buoyancy minus the force of gravity and divided by mass, just like we do here. That will be, uh, it's not gravity, but it's, I don't know what you want, let's call it G star. It's the equivalent of gravity for this situation. Okay. And then the period of this will be 2 pi times the square root of L over G, but in this case, the G is this stuff here. I guess I just don't understand why it has to be that way. Well, oh, there's Clay. Mm -hmm. Hey Clay. Hey. We were missing you. <laughs> Sorry I'm late. You're all right. <laughs> so uh, we're wrestling with the balloon pendulum in chapter 13. Ah, uh, okay. So uh, Beth asked the, a, a great question. Why does it have to be this way? And, and here's the reason, Beth. If you clip this string here, with a regular pendulum, pendulum, what's that? What's that bob gonna do? Fall straight down. It's gonna fall straight down. How fast? 
at the force of gravity if it wasn't moving? At 9.8 G, right? At 9.8 meters per second squared, G. If you clip this string, what's it going to do? Uh, well, it depends on how much helium is in it. That's right. It's going to accelerate up if there's enough helium in there, right? Hey, Anna. So it's going to accelerate up with an, if there's enough helium. And how fast will it accelerate up? Well, this fast. Okay. The force of buoyancy minus the force, the net force divided by mass will give you its acceleration. Okay. And so that's what goes down there. Okay. I never would have put this. It's the, uh, you could use the word the local acceleration if you wanted to. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, and you're right. Uh, That's kind of a, a leap of logic to to get there. But I think we did something similar to it when uh, when we we're doing the pendulum stuff, where we put a pendulum on the moon or something like that, and uh, and. So using nine, so using, so using nine point eight, we used gravity on the moon, and the same thing here. Now instead of using nine point eight, we're going to use the local gravity of this helium balloon, which is whatever the net force is divided by mass. It's how fast it would accelerate right. if you cut the string. I didn't even think about doing it that way. I guess I didn't think about that equal acceleration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. I hope that makes sense to me. It okay. makes sense right now. Good. But well, that's a good start. <laughs> We're going to be safe that right one. OK. <laughs> OK. Uh, Clay and Anna, I know you just both got here, so I'm not really going to ask you if this makes sense, because you didn't see anything. <laughs> uh, Clay, do you have any questions for today? Um, for you. Five so long, it's not your five. Go to three on chapter 13. Number three? It's, it's, well, it's just a short answer one, but how about two? Two looks fun. <laughs> uh, I have one of these toys. I do too, and I always wondered. <laughs> They're great fun. You put the little spring inside and you push it. Mine's, a, mine's, a, mine's in the shape of a ladybug and you push it down and it, it sits there, but it's so sporadic. Sometimes it'll sit there for an hour and you've long since forgotten about it. And then it'll boing and make you jump out of your skin. Um, okay, so you've got this children's toy and the spring is smashed and uh, then it gives you a mass. It tells you how high it jumps, and you have to find the spring constant. This is chapter Am I in the right chapter? Yeah, this is chapter 13. Okay, so. Basically, you've got this little springy toy thingy, and the spring is all smashed, all smashed up here. And, uh, and we're going to use our work energy theorem. Ener energy initial equals energy final minus the work not conserved, of which there is none, because it's, there's no friction. It doesn't tell us anything about friction, so we're just going to ignore it. And in the initial situation, all the energy is in that spring. It's stored energy. And so the equation for that is 1 half k delta x squared. And a minute later, this thing pops up, and it flies way up here. And uh, the spring is all expanded, but it's up high in the air now. And the height that it reached was 55. Some, I don't know, what's your number, Clay? 55. Okay. 55 centimeters up in the air. And uh, 
So now, the only energy that it has now, because it's at the top of that, is gravitational potential energy, mgh. And I think it tells you everything you need here. Let's see. Um, it tells you how much it's compressed. That's delta x. And um, it tells you the mass. Oh, uh, yeah. Suppose it and does. it tells you the height. And you know gravity. And you're asked yep. for k. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a lot easier than I thought it was. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's pretty straightforward. I think the, the newest piece of this is just how to... We're dealing with that spring, potential this energy of a stored spring. Mm -hmm. All right, that's not too bad. Thank you. Uh huh. Uh, you also asked about number three. Uh, I was just kind of spitballing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that it was like a like a short answer one, and I, I was like, "There's not really a much of a like <laughs> you, you know, can't work that out." The the beautiful part about these like the one number three is you can write anything you want in there. <laughs> I mean, you can just write the lights are shining today and it says, good job, full credit. <laughs> and, uh, but there is a concept here. I did put the question on here because it's a good question. It helps you think through what you need to think through. Um, let me read it. Consider the simplified piston engine in the figure shown. If the wheel rotates at a constant angular speed of omega, explain why the piston rod oscillates in simple harmonic motion. Uh, do you think you can describe that, Clay? Um, in simple terms, I feel like <laughs> since, the, uh, since the wheel is what's driving the piston and it's uh -huh. at a constant speed, then it should be a constant harmonic motion sort of feel like it just it, everything's stable so I feel like it should be yeah let's see I'm gonna put this there's like a, a peg there and there's this sort of trap thing around here and then that's attached to this piston out here that slides up and down inside of a tube, something like that. Okay, so as this wheel here, as it rotates, that peg is going to go back and around in the circle like this. As the peg goes up, it's just going to slide inside this track here. But as the peg goes this way, it's going to pull the whole track with it. Which is going to drink, which is going to draw that piston down, and so then as it comes back around, then it's going to push that piston forward, and then it's going to go up, and pull the piston back. And if this were a square wheel, which don't exist, but if it was square, on this side it would do nothing but go up, and on this side it would do nothing but pull the piston and then straight down, and then push the piston. But because it's a round wheel, you get a little bit of x and y motion perpetually. It's always little bits of both. And so it ends up that that sine curve, that traditional cosine or sine curve, has little bits of um, like right here. It has zero x velocity because that that when that peg works its way around and it's right here, it's going to go straight up. No horizontal piece at all. And when it's moved over just a little bit, it'll have, it'll be going this way, which is mostly up with a little bit over. But by the time it's over here, it's all the way over and no up at all. And that's what this describes. This says, when you're right at the middle, here, no x velocity at all. When you go up just a little bit, you've got just a little bit of motion, and a little bit more, and a little bit more, and you get up here, and it's a whole lot of motion. And then it decreases, decreases until you're back at zero, and then that's over here. And this is a lot of words to say that simple harmonic motion is one dimension of circular motion. Circular motion is 2D. So the, let me say that again. The key word is simple harmonic motion is one dimension of circular motion. 
good. Okay, I don't know. You didn't really ask for that, but I just I pushed nah, it on you. I pushed on you anyway. Useful. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Ansley, you joined while I was monologuing over there. Uh, Anna, your next. What question do you have? No, that's so. So let me let me. What problem is that? Uh, it's loud. It's the last lab. Problem four on the last lab. Problem three. Problem. This is problem three on the last lab, which is the the waves on a string lab. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the whole thing with that is to get you to realize that you can send one wave down the string by pushing the button. And it sends a wave down the string. You push the button and it sends another wave. You push the button again and it'll send another wave. But each wave that you send down the string will bounce back. Mm -hmm. And if you're careful about it and you hit it at just the right frequency, then each wave will add up constructively. So it's not about how many times you hit it, but... How many times per second, which is the definition of a frequency. So the question could be rephrased to ask, with what frequency would you have to push the button to get the first standing wave? Is that what I asked for, the first, mm -hmm. the first standing wave? So what is the frequency of the first standing wave is how that question could be rephrased. Okay. But it's worded that way to make you think through what's going, what does frequency mean? Frequency means how many times does that little machine make a wave? Okay, good. Thank you. Uh-huh. Uh, Anthony, I think it's your turn. What questions do you have? Um, chapter 9, homework number 12. Chapter 9. Number 12. Let's see. Chapter 9. Give me a minute to get there, okay? Ah, number 12. The YouTube problem before YouTube means what it means now. Uh, okay, so you've got tube, and this, this could be any kind of tube you want. I mean, it could be a glass tube, it could be garden hose, whatever. It's just, it's a tube. And you fill it with water, and the water naturally on its own forms these two edges of the water are going to be level. It, 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 it's, it's a fancy word, it's called a plumber's level. You can level two sides of a house with a garden hose. You just stretch it on both sides of the house, fill the hose with water, and the two ends will be perfectly level. So you, you can, the Egyptians made the pyramids level with this method. Uh, so that's step one. Step two is you then add, you <laughs> wow. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It just scared me. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you start with this, and then step two, you pour the oil into one side. Now, oil is lighter weight than water. It's, it's less dense. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to float on top of the water, and, but it will push the water down a little bit. And so you get that second picture where you have the same tube but now the water on this side has risen a little bit higher it's up here now and the water on this side has shrunk a little bit it's gone lower and from here to here is oil and all this 
is water. Okay, so let's just do that before we get to part three, the, the third piece of this. So, um, first of all, uh, Ansley, what's, what's the length of your oil? Sorry, say that one more time. 6.3? Centimeters. Oh, okay. 6.3 centimeters. And, uh, and what's the density of your oil? 750. You like the Uh, Just as a side note, what is the density of water? 1,000. Good. Mm -hmm. Um, and the question is, how high, so these two are the same height here, the question is, how high does this rise? Now, hi, hi Clyde, how are you doing? <laughs> there he is, hey Clyde, uh, let's see. I always have to think about this. this oil is the same as the weight of this water from here to here so weight of water equals the weight of the oil in this green section here compared to this black section over here. Now notice this water, this green section, is smaller than the oil section. Does that kind of make sense? So the oil is heavier than the water is? No, the, the water is heavier and that's why it's shorter. It doesn't take up as much, there's, it doesn't take as much water to have the same weight as the oil. Mm -hmm. And so let's find L of the water, which is not H, it's just close to it. Okay, so we've got L of the oil Right there, that's 6.3, and that's more than L of the water. Okay, so let's see. What is weight? How do we find weight? Any ideas? There you go. So we're going to need, carry this over here, so we're going to need mass of the water times gravity equals mass of the oil times gravity. Okay? How are we going to get the mass of the water and the oil? Oops. In the density, which is mass over... Yep, yep. Okay. Density is mass per volume. So, uh, mass is density times volume, right? So we need density of water, times volume of water times gravity equals density of oil times volume of oil times gravity. Does this make sense so far? Okay, 
notice gravity cancels out on both sides. Now, how do you find volume of a cylinder? But I think, did you, no, Ansley, you emailed this to me, didn't you? Who emailed, emailed this to me this question? Volume of a cylinder? That was me. And I didn't reply, did I? I don't think I did. Sorry. How, how do you find volume of a cylinder? It's, it's going to be the area of the circle on the top times mm -hmm. the height of the cylinder. So volume of a cylinder is area times height which is pi r squared times height. So I'm going to include that right here. So this weight of water is density of water times pi r squared, the radius of this hose here, this pipe, times L, because that's L that we're looking for, and that's L of the water. We've already canceled out gravity. And same thing on this side, oil. And for volume, I'm going to write pi r squared times L of the oil. Now, notice that this hose is the same radius all the way around. If I was a good artist, it would actually look that way. So the pi is on both sides, so it cancels out. And the r square cancels out as well on both sides. So we can get this equation boiled down to the density of water times the length of the water equals the density of oil times the length of the oil. So now we can solve for this. We can solve for the length of the, oil, of the water by doing density of oil times the length of the oil divided by density of water. Now, here's what that's going to do for us. That's going to give us this amount here, which is not H, what we're trying to find. We're trying to find H from here to here. H. That's what the question is trying to get us to find. And we haven't found that. We found the length of that water. as compared to the length of the oil over here. So how are we going to do that? Well, it's in the black lines that I have drawn here. If you look at them carefully, and this is why a good picture helps. I'm not claiming to have a good picture here, but it's, I think it's sufficient here. This back one rose a little bit, and the front one fell a little bit. But here's the thing, the front one fell that much. <clears throat> and the back one rose that much. If we do, let's see, let's call this, I don't know colors, I haven't used blue yet. Let's call this distance here x. You can see that uh, see. L of the oil minus L of the water equals H. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, I didn't get through it for a minute. 
however far this one went up, that's how far the other one went down. And what pushed it down? The oil. So this, if I was a good artist, the X and the H would be the same thing. Yes. Okay. So what? Um, I'm going back to the problem. Oh, we haven't done part C yet. Does does part B make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. Part C. What's going to happen now is you're going to take this same U tube, U shaped tube, and the oil was higher than the water, but you're going to put a shelter over this side so that no air is going to blow over it, and you're going to blow with like a air compressor or something like that and blow air across the top of this really fast so that the oil lowers itself and the water raises itself so that this side and this side are again equal to each other but they're going to be higher than it was when it was just water because there's more stuff in the hose so now from here to here lower than that, you're going to have oil and from here to here you're going to have water, but they're now level, not because the oil is just as heavy as water, but because you've, you're blowing across the top of this. And because you put this little tent over this side, there's no air blowing across that one. And the reason this happens is because of Bernoulli's equation. And Bernoulli's equation, uh, I don't think we've worked through that yet this semester. Are we doing Bernoulli's equation yet? No, we did. I did the lectures, but okay. So let me write that up here. So Bernoulli's equation is EO plus rho g h plus one half rho v squared. And these are all um, one h one. Equals P2 plus rho G H2 plus one half rho V2 squared. This is Bernoulli's equation. It's a. It looks a little on the messy side. But what Bernoulli's equation simply tells us is that as speed goes up, pressure goes down. So because you're blowing across this one pressure here is going to decrease, allowing this to slide up because air pressure here on this side is still atmospheric pressure pushing it down. So the way you use this equation is you pick out two points. So step one is find two points. And <clears throat> the two points that I think we should use are going to be this point and this point. And uh, so let's call this one point one and this one point two. Now the first question asks, what's the pressure at point one? And and here's the thing. Sorry. So we don't know P1 or P2, and we're going to put the ground right here. 
So we've got pressure one that we don't know. We've got rho GH, that's density times gravity times height. But we've put in both our points on the ground, so there is no height. So this is going to be plus zero for this piece because the height is zero. It's right on the ground. Plus one half the density of the fluid that's moving. And what fluid is moving here? <laughs> yeah, this one's air. So it's going to be the density of air times its speed squared. And then that's the thing we're looking for, the speed. And this equals P2. And we don't know that one either. That's the pressure over here. Plus zero, because it's on the ground. Plus zero, because we put the tent over it, so there's no motion. The speed is zero, and the height is zero. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to subtract that P1 over there. So this is going to give me 1 half density of air times speed squared equals P2 minus P1. Or just simply difference in pressure. And now this water here had to rise a certain amount. It had to go, it had to go up so that these two could be low. And that amount that it went up, uh, it's going to still be this x amount again, uh, this h. It's going to have this little piece of water right here got picked up that high because of this difference in pressure. And that pressure that is equal to density times gravity times height. And so we said we're going to put this here equal to density times gravity times height of this little river, this little water. This is the reason we have atmospheric pressure pushing on us now. It's because the uh, atmosphere is stacked up on top of us and it's pushing on us. And so you had to pull this up with a certain amount of pressure to uh, get it to rise that high. I think I've stuttered and stammered a lot on this problem. The end result is, this is how you're going to get there. Okay. Uh, Y'all, what do you think? How are you doing? So I got kind of lost. Where exactly did you say that density, gravity, height goes? Um, so this... <laughs> This P2 is going to be higher than P1 because the airspeed is blowing across this one, so the pressure is going to get lower. And because there's a difference in pressure there, it's going to push this one down, and this one's going to rise up. And it's going to rise up the same amount of X again. And when it rises up, because this pressure is pushing it down, the question is how how hard does that pressure have to push in order to pick that water up this high? Well, it's got to pick it up, the density times gravity times height, the density of water times gravity times height. How hot, and that, that height is going to be this x. And so this difference in pressure is that rho gh, and that's equal to one half density of air times speed squared. I used up all my forward space. Let me write this again. Density of water times gravity times what I'm calling x over here, which is the same thing as h from part b, equals one half density of air times how fast the air is moving squared. And you need to solve for B.
So is P2 and P1 equal to P times G times H? Is that what we're saying? Or yes. does that not even matter anymore? Uh, yeah, that's what this is, P times G times H. But it's, it's not P, it's density. It's rho. Okay. Density so times gravity times the height is x. That's how high this water has to be raised. Okay, but why would it be x, like two of the x's? Because in this one, it was already at x, so would it not be another x? Or do those two x's have to each other out? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's another x. So this x, and this x, and this h are all the same value. Okay. And I'm sorry, I'm a horrible artist. And how are you doing there? That's that's this density times gravity times height. So the, the pressure here pushed down, which picked the water up that high, and that height is x, which is density times gravity times the height, which is the value of x. Okay. Does that you doing all right? Ansley, what do you think? Looks like you have a question brewing. Well, I did it, and I got the problem wrong. Oh. <laughs> so, um, that box blue, the density of water, how gravity comes fix. We're solving for that B, right? For the answer? Uh, I think the answer is asking for V over here. Okay. Is that what you did? Okay. Let me read it again. You know, I think I might be butchering this problem here. How about, uh, how about I make a separate video of this problem later? Because I'm, my brain is not clear on this problem right now. So just erase this from your memory and uh, I'll make a separate video for it another time. Okay. So I think I, I, I did something wrong. I'm not sure where it is. Something is awry though. Okay, whose question was that? Was that Ansley's question? Okay. And I totally butchered it. Okay, I did too. Uh, do you have another one since I butchered that one? Not right now. Okay. Uh, Beth, we're back to you. Okay. Um... I think I wanted to do number mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember which ones have already been done. I'm usually better about keeping track of that, but I just didn't. I think I want to do number five. I don't think we've done that one yet. In chapter 13? Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, you've got a block, and it's resting on a friction, frictionless horizontal surface, and it's on a spring. It gives you the spring constant, 
and there's a force pulling it. And the first question is, what is the value of that force? Okay, so. So you've got a block, and it's just sitting here. This is where it likes to sit. It's the equilibrium spot. So if you, if you weren't pushing on it or weren't pulling on it, nothing. It was just, it would sit there. Okay? But then you grab it, and you pull it. And as a result of you pulling it, it slides over a certain distance before it comes to a new equilibrium. And it's going to stop out here some distance later. And it tells you how far. Uh, what's your number, uh, Beth? Five centimeters. Five even? Uh, yes, sir. I believe so. Five centimeters. Five centimeters. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, and the question is, how hard do you have to pull on it to get it to slide out that far? And, and the way you do this is you say, you use Hooke's Law. So you say, um, the sum of the forces equals uh, zero. And the force is on this thing when it's all the way out here is the force of you pulling it, pulling it to the right, and the force of the spring pulling it back to the left. Because you gotta remember this spring is all stretched out here and it's trying to pull it back. So the spring's pulling to the left, you're pulling it to the right, and those have to add up to zero because it's come to a stop way out here. <coughs> and so the equation for the force of a spring is. Um, K delta X, which is zero, and so this has to add up to zero. So the force that you have to pull it with is just simply K delta X. I believe it gives you a spring constant, doesn't it? It does. Okay. Uh, for me, anyway, it's A is equal to eight. Okay, so it gives you a spring okay. constant, tells you the distance, and then you have to find the force. That's part A. Okay. I think part I got that wrong because I put half in front of it. Uh, so ah, yeah. yeah. That would be potential energy. Right. Okay, part B says, what is the total energy stored? Now, here's your, here's your half. What's the energy stored in the spring? So now that you've got it stretched out here, that spring has energy stored in it, because as soon as you let go, it's going to snap it back. That potential energy um, is going to be 1 half K delta X, but don't forget to square this. K delta X squared. Um, part C says find the magnitude of the acceleration of the block as soon as you let go. So now we're going to do sum of the forces equals ma. It's not going to be zero because it's not at equilibrium now because you've let go. It's, you pulled it out to here, you applied a force to get it there, but now you let go. So what does your force become? Yeah, your force becomes zero. So now you've got negative force of the spring equals mass times acceleration. And so you've got negative K delta X equals mass times acceleration. If you divide both sides by mass, you can get acceleration. And that negative sign just means it accelerates to the left, but I think the question just says find the magnitude of the acceleration. Which means, yeah, so it doesn't care about the, the negative just tells you direction. And the problem specifically says just the amount, don't, kill, don't tell me the direction. So don't include the negative sign there. Um, part D says find the speed of the block when it's back here. So you pulled it out here, you let it go, and it goes flying back. And it's going to be flying back, and it's going to go right through this equilibrium. And it's going to fly through there pretty fast. The question is, how fast is that? Well, for that part, you're going to want to use the work energy theorem. Energy initial equals energy final minus work not conserved. 
I think this is frictionless, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's no friction. And so initial energy was when you're out here, this is the start. So initial energy is one half K delta X squared, because it's all in that stored in that spring. And the final energy is right back here. And that's the equilibrium position of the spring. So there's, the spring is not stretched or compressed. There's no spring energy here. It's all kinetic energy. And now you solve it for speed. Okay. And then part E asks, if the surface is not frictionless, but the block still reaches the equilibrium position, how would your answer to part D change? Would it be going faster or slower or the same? I thought it would be slower. Why? Because it has drag. You can't go just like... Exactly. If it's got drag, it's going to slow down. So another way to say it is some of this original stored energy had to do work to overcome friction, so there'll be less of it available for the speed. Okay. Um, and then part F asks, what other information would you need to know the actual answer to D, in this case, and I guess it means if there were friction, you would have to know uh, Coefficient of friction? Yep, you'd have to know the coefficient of friction. Yep. Okay. I think the main problem was that I put a half in front of the right, A right here. for part A. Yep, that'll get you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Anna, I think it's your turn. Chapter 14, problem four. Okay, so you've got a bat flying at a certain speed and it's chasing a bug looking for dinner. And then it tells you the speed Sorry, it tells you the frequency of the bat's chirp. And you, you know how bats eat. They use echolocation because they're blind, blind as a bat. And so they have to use sound to find their food, so they make a noise. And it bounces off the bug and comes back to them. And that tells them how far away the bug is, which way the bug is moving, and how fast. All, it, all in a chirp, which is pretty impressive, actually. That's... I mean, we think visualize because we think in terms of visual, but a bat is blind. It might not think the same way we do, but yeah, it can see the insect <laughs> without eyes, which is pretty slick. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and then it asks, what is the speed of the insect? Uh, so this is a Doppler effect problem. It's actually a double Doppler effect problem, which is what makes it complicated. So let's, let's step through it. Um, so here's your bat. like a battery. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so there's your bat, and there's your little bug. And if I were the bug, I'd be flying this way. I don't know, the problem didn't tell us which way the bug is flying. I'm, I'll just, the bug is moving somewhere. <clears throat> and uh, so step one, the bat makes the sound. And that sound wave travels over to the bug. Now the bug may or may not have ears, may or may not hear it. We don't really care, but we have to 
figure out what frequency would the bug hear it at this point. Because what's going to happen is, with that frequency, that original sound wave is going to bounce off of the bug and fly back to the bat. So step one is frequency goes over to the bug, and the bug will hear a different frequency because the bat's moving and the bug's moving. And then it will bounce off the bug at that frequency and go back to the bat, and the bat will hear a third frequency because the bug's moving and the bat's moving. So let's do step one first. So the equation for this, and do you have your equation sheet handy? Because I never remember this. I think it's frequency observed is equal to, and I don't remember after that. <laughs> Something like the frequency of the source times the speed of sound minus or plus speed of sound and then minus or plus. I forget which way it goes. On the top is V sound plus V of the observer. On the V sound. So uh, <clears throat> this is the equation we're going to use. And for now, for step one, the uh, observer is the bug, and the source is the bat. So uh, what are your numbers? What, are, what is the frequency of the source? bat. 39.8. And that's, that's something weird, like kilo, kilohertz, right? Kilo hertz. And what does the kilo mean? It means times 10 to the third. So it means move the decimal three places. Over. Oh yeah, you said thousand. That's right. So this is nine or three nine eight which is way higher than you and I can hear. Um, <clears throat> so it tells you that frequency. And does it tell you the speed of the bat? Yes. Okay, so the speed of the source in this case, which is the speed of the bat, is what now? 4.95. 4.95 meters per second. So let's plug all this in up here. So now... This is going to tell us that the frequency observed by the bug is equal to the frequency of the source, which is 39800 of the bat, times the speed of sound, which it pro probably gives you, minus speed of the bug, I'm sorry, plus the speed of the bug, divided by the speed of sound minus the speed of the bat. Now, bat is chasing an, an insect, uh, and it does tell you, flying in the same direction. So which way is the bug flying? That way. Same direction as the bat. Away from the bat. Okay? So here's the thing. And I think this says it on the equation sheet. These two numbers become positive, like the signs of these two numbers change if they're going towards or away. So what that means is the bat is going towards the bug. So this is a positive 4.95. So where it says minus positive speed of bat. Does that make sense? Because the bat, so this is going to be speed of sound minus speed of the bat. And at speed of the bat, you're going to plug in a positive 4.95. So it won't be plus. But this one, this says plus the speed of the bug, the speed of the observer, but our observer is going away. So this needs to be plus a negative speed of the bug, because the bug is going away from the bat. Okay, so let's write all this out. Frequency of the bug 
equals 39,800. Uh, speed of sound is given as 343 minus speed of bug. Did you see what that became a minus? Yes. Because plus a negative. And then downstairs, you're going to have 343 minus 4.95. How many unknowns do you have here? Two. Mm. Not looking good, right? We need a second equation. We need a second equation. Well, where are we going to get that? That's going to be from a sound wave now bouncing off the bug and flying back to the bat. So now, in step two, the observer is the bat, and the source is the bug, because it's bouncing, that same original sound wave is now bouncing off of the bug and coming, leaving the bug and coming to the bat. Does that make sense? How, how this becomes the source and this becomes the observer? Yep. So now our equation is going to be frequency observed by the bat. Um, but I'm going to call it bat2 because it's not the original one. It's not the same frequency that was... It's, it's, a, it's a different frequency than what the bat originally... When he chirped originally, it's, it's gonna, he's going to hear something different. Um, equals the frequency of the source. Well, that's the frequency that's coming off the bug, right? Well, what's that? Well, that's this. So I'm going to write that frequency coming from the bug, but that is all of this. Times, now we're going to write this up here, speed of sound, plus the speed of the observer. Now here your observer is traveling towards the source, so it's going to be plus the speed of the bat, and that's a positive speed of the bat because the bat is flying towards the source here. Divided by the speed of sound minus the speed of the source, which is going away. So this is going to be the speed of the bug. Um, and that's going to be negative speed of bug. So when we write all this out, and I my black pen is dying here, so. Yes, I nailed it. <laughs> I don't usually do that. Okay, so speed, oops. Frequency observed by the bat, second frequency, is going to be equal to all this stuff up here 39800 times 343 minus speed bug divided by 343 minus 4.95 times this stuff 343 plus speed of the bat 4.95 divided by 343 minus a negative speed of the bug, which becomes plus the bug. And now you have one equation. Oh, uh, oh, and I think we're told this one, aren't we? Yeah. This one is 40, well, what, what's your number for the second frequency? 40.5. 40.5? And that's again kilohertz, right? Mm -hmm. So that's four zero five zero zero. And now the only thing that you don't know is speed of bug. One equation, one unknown. That's what you're looking for. Okay, conceptually, does that problem make sense? Yes. Okay. Just through the algebra. Yeah, the algebra on this is a bit messy. Okay. Uh, Beth, Ansley, I saw Clay left earlier. Um, how are you two doing on this one? Um, just trying to figure out how to do the algebra. I think you just like multiply and divide. Those. Yeah, it's going to be a bit messy. 
Um, conceptually, do you, does it make sense how to get here? Conceptually, yes. I'm just trying to figure okay. out how to not cancel those two out because you can't because one's a negative and one's a positive. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Ansley, does this kind of make sense how to get here? Yes, I but I'm stuck with the algebra too. Okay, okay. Let's look at the algebra. Oh, so let me erase everything but this bottom part here. So let's see, uh, 4,500 equals 39,800 times, uh, let's start by adding these two together and then multiplying that number times this. So what's, what's the summation of those two? Lazy route and just said, I'll oh, punch that out. Okay, anyway. 347.95 times V bug. And now what's, so now, so that's the summation of these two. And we're going to multiply that times this and this. This one I just wrote down. Yeah. But now this one, what's this one? Um, 11 times do the same thing on the bottom, find this uh, difference, and then we'll multiply it here and here. Take the denominator here and send it upstairs. We'll distribute this one. Let's take this number, distribute it here and here. And we'll send this one upstairs and distribute it. So I'm going to write out the distribution here. So we're going to have 40 and 500 times 11, 5, 9, 5, 1, 1, 5, 1, 5, plus 3, 38.05. Speed of the bug equals three nine eight hundred times eleven nine three or six point eight five minus three forty seven point nine five times the speed of the bug. So distribute this here and distribute this here. Does that make sense? Probably would have been a lot easier if we just left it as letters, but my brain got lazy. So, the first one is going to be four point six nine six times two to the ten. Third. Sense okay. Plus this times this. Now 
long way street goes here and, and then there. Did I drop the number somewhere? I feel like this number should be bigger than this number. Now you can see we're going to combine like terms. So we're going to take this piece here, add it over there, and this piece here, and subtract it over there. So we get all the V bugs in the same place. So we're going to have 1.369 times 10 to the 7th times V bug. That's going to be the code plus when we add it over here, plus 1.38 times 10 to the 7th V bug equals 0.75 times 10 to the 9th. And this is going to become a minus when you add it over there, so it's going to be minus 4.6 times 9, uh, 6.96 times 10 to the 9th. So the last step is we're going to pull this V bug out of here, or second to the last step. So we're going to have 1.369 to the seventh plus one point three eight times to the seventh times V bug equals that. Okay, so what are these two numbers? What's this number over here? This difference? Yeah, okay. Can you give me a couple more? Just 5.4 what? It was just 5.4 zeros after it. Okay. Yeah, that makes, that makes more sense. That, makes, that seems right. Okay, now what's this summation? this number over there. There you go. 
go. A whole bunch of big numbers boiled down to. That's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> I think it would have been. I think it would have been better to have done this with letters rather than numbers, but I'm glad it worked out. Okay, uh, Beth and Ansley, what do y'all think? Did the algebra help? Yeah. I just don't like algebra. <laughs> <laughs> Language of physics is math. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I think Ansley goes after Anna. I don't have any more questions. Okay. Beth, we're back to you then. Um, okay. Um. Number 11. Oh, we just did this one yesterday. Or Monday, I mean. So that one should be posted up. Did we? Uh huh. Okay. I want to use. I thought we did number a different one on 13 on, the, on Monday. Which one are you asking okay. about? Let me make sure. Number 11. The, the helium balloon won the rope. No, ma'am. I am, sir. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong chapter. Yeah, yeah. Let me try the right chapter. Which one now? Number, Number 11? Number 11. Yeah, we haven't done that one. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. okay. Problem 11 of chapter 13. You've got a 3 kilogram object fastened to a light spring passes over a pulley, and the pulley is frictionless and massless. And uh, the object is released from rest when the spring is unstretched. <clears throat> uh, if the object drops 10.2 centimeters, So, got ground, a spring attached to a string that goes over a pulley attaches to a mass and the spring itself is unstretched and the mass is just hanging there I mean you're holding it so that the string so the spring doesn't stretch but then you let go and it's going to fall down and it's going to go past the equilibrium point and it's going to start this oscillation it's going to start that oscill oscillatory motion again so the question is, how far down does it go before it stops and turns around? Okay, so it's going to go all the way down to here, and it's going to stop, and it's going to turn around and bounce back and forth between these two spots. And so the question is, how far does it go? And the way you answer this question is with the work energy theorem. In the initial situation, what kind of energy do you have? Um, I'm 
the first situation, it tells me that the thing dropped 10.9 centimeters. Oh, okay. It tells you that? Yes. Well, then what do you ask for? Oh, the it's spring constant. For the K constant. Okay. And then the spring constant. Okay. So what kind of energy does it have here? Um, I thought it was kinetic energy because the spring is unstretched. And I thought it was only potential energy when it was crunched up. Ah. But okay. Uh, at this point, it hasn't started moving, though. You're still holding it. And, well, you're, you're, you um, just let go. So it hasn't had a chance to get going yet. So there's no speed, so there's no kinetic right. energy. But it is, remember the three questions you got to ask yourself? Mm -hmm. Is it moving? And the answer is no. It's going to move, but it hasn't moved yet. And uh, is it off the ground? And is there a spring stretched or compressed? So in this first case here, the, string, the spring is not stretched or compressed. It's not moving, but it is off the ground. And of course, okay. that, that begs the question, where's the ground? And remember, the best answer to that question is, what's the lowest point of your object? The lowest point of your object, call that the ground. Okay. So in this initial situation, it has the potential energy from gravity, just MGH. Okay. Now, in this final situation, so you drop it from here, and it's going to go all the way down here. It's going to get to that lowest point possible, and it's going to stop. It's about to turn around and go back, but it is stopped here. So, um, is it moving? Uh, not quite. No, you're right. Uh, it's, it's correct. It's not moving. Uh, is it off the ground? Mm. No, it's on I the ground. It's off the ground there. Exactly. And then thirdly, uh, is there a spring stretched or compressed? It's stretched. Yeah, so there's the spring. It got stretched out because the mass is this way down there. So, yeah, so we've got one half k delta x squared, and it said there was no friction. So, um, I think it tells you everything in here except for k. You gotta solve for k. Yeah, I mean, I got that far. It's just that I guess. In the second half of it, I, was, I wasn't thinking about the spring being something or another. I don't know. Oh, look, don't okay, know so let's do part that. B then. So you got part A, but you haven't got part B yet? Uh, I haven't got either of them, actually. Oh, okay. I don't know what I've done wrong. Okay. Uh, so you just got to solve for K here. So um, what we'll do is we'll multiply both sides by 2. To get rid of the half, Oops. and then uh, we'll divide both sides by delta x squared. So that's going to cancel out there. So we'll get k is equal to two mgh divided by delta x squared. I don't know what I did wrong then. Maybe I just put the numbers in wrong. Could be. That's entirely possible. I'll try it. Oh, oh did you did you convert your did you convert your centimeters to meters? It, that would be a thing that could have not happened. Okay. Yeah. Make sure you do that because it's given as ten point or whatever whatever your number is, ten point nine centimeters. So you got to convert that to meters. So make sure you move this decimal over two places. That was probably what it was. Okay. I'll look back and see. Okay, so that goes in there for H um, and delta X. So delta X and H are the same thing. So really, you can cancel out this one and that square. Because it's this, the H is the delta X. It's the same amount. Um, part B asks, if the object drops at 10.2 centimeters before dropping, find the speed of the object when it is 5.65 centimeters below the starting point. So now, and I'll draw this in blue, you've got your block, and it's right here. Um, 
5.65 or whatever. What's your number, Beth? 5.35. 5.35. So it's 5.35 centimeters below that. And the question is, how fast is it moving there? And you're going to use this exact same equation again, except that you've got to add the piece in there. So let's write it out. So we've got energy initial equals energy final minus the work not conserved. In the initial situation, that's up here. What kind of energy do you have? Uh, potential energy. So it's the same as Just MGH, you're right. And then this final situation here, what kind of energy do you have? I mean, it's moving, so it's yep. kinetic energy. Yep, one half mv squared, and there's another one. The spring version? Yeah. You've got that spring is partially, it's not stretched as far as it can go, but it is stretched, so it is consuming some energy there. So this is going to be plus one half k delta x squared. So I guess my question in the initial situation is, is that is the spring not stretched in both situations? Because it's not compressed. It, up here, it's not stretched at all. Okay. But by the time it moves down here, it is stretched. Anywhere below here, it's going to stretch. Just here, it's not stretched. Okay. Maybe that's what it was. Is that I was thinking it was stretched on both ends? I couldn't figure out how it's supposed to get K if it canceled out on both sides. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, it's just K on one side. Okay. And, and notice for this part B, you want to make this part right here. That's your ground for part B. Because you always, the lowest point your object goes in the problem, that's where you put your ground. And so for part B, the lowest part the problem goes is right there. So that's, make that the ground. Okay. So with the X and the H on this problem, is it the same thing as yes. before? That's right. This, this delta X and this H are going to be the same value because... <laughs> This, this is your H, that's how far the object falls, but then since the spring starts stretching here, that's how far the spring is going to stretch as well. Okay. So yeah, you're right, those are the same values. This H and this delta X. Mistakes. You hope what now? I'm just making stupid mistakes in the math. And it's, oh. I gotta figure out how to stop that <laughs> if I can. Yeah. Well, the stupid mistakes on the test aren't gonna hurt you very bad. Because the bulk of your points are in setting the problem up. So as long as you set it up nicely and show me what you're doing, that's gonna be most, if not all, of the points. Some problems, I'll, I'll take up a small amount for a, a, you know, punching the number in properly, but the main thing is knowing how to set it up. Okay. All the same, you're right, you should try to <laughs> not do all those silly mistakes, but that's just, that the way you get to the point where you stop doing that is practice. The more you practice, the fewer mistakes you make. But 
I make mistakes still too, so I, I mean it happens. Yeah. We're humans, therefore we are imperfect. It's the result of the curse. That's why the ground bears yeah. thorns as well. Yep. Yes. Um, like sometimes it's just like calculating to get around up my numbers on the phone. <laughs> What'd you say, Beth? Sometimes my calculator will just round the numbers on its own. So the thing will say, You're rounding up too much. And I'm like, I'm not, though, actually. Oh. If you. Don't ever round anything off at all till you get to your to plug till you plug it into WebAssign. Then it, it won't give you any rounding errors. But so yeah. always keep at least four sig figs along the way, if not more. I'm just saying that the calculator does it for me, oh. and I don't know how to make it stop. Mm. So like when we were doing that problem earlier, where it was asking for like, where you guys got five point something else, it rounded mine up to six. So it was six to the seventh power, but you guys are using like six point something else for the number four on chapter 14. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. just rounded mine up straight up to six. And I don't know how to make it not do that. Um, it shouldn't. What kind of calculator are you using? It's one of the PI. Yeah, those shouldn't be doing that. Um, hmm. I've looked in the settings and everything to see why it does that, but it just it rounds it up. I. Uh, when you go to yeah, to check your. I don't have mine in front of me, but I, I guess it's in, it's in mode. Make sure it's not in scientific or engineering mode, it's in whatever the normal mode. I guess it's just called normal mode. <laughs> Make sure it's in the normal mode. Okay. Um, I mean, yeah. it's just in calculation mode is normal, but it rounds up all my numbers, and I don't know how to make it not do. Hmm. If I could speak to that, that would be a simple thing. If you could what now? If I could learn how to speak correctly, I would be. <laughs> just it helps. All it helps. Out. It helps when the computer trans transmits the sound properly as well. And uh, my vocal cords don't cut out. <laughs> uh, I don't know that the calculator should be doing it right. I wonder if there's uh, a button pushing mistake that happened. Um, it it could be. I don't know. Yeah. It's just like it's happening over and over again. Okay. So it's like the computer, like the web assign says that I need to go carry it out, but every time I put the numbers in, I'm like, it's adding up these numbers and then changing it to be a whole number, if it can be. Next time you do it, email me the numbers you punched in, and I'll look at it and see. Okay. Because I've got a TI-80 something or other as well, and I can maybe try to make it duplicate your mistakes and figure out what the catch is. Okay. I'll send it to you the next time I catch it doing it. Okay. Okay. Uh, do y'all have any more questions? Uh, I kind of want to try the rest of them on my own. Okay. So, yeah. not right now. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Well, I don't have any more either. Okay. Or on Monday. Okay. Sounds good. Well, y'all have a good weekend. Thanks for coming. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'll see you. Okay. Bye. Bye, Clyde. <laughs> okay, have a good one. Bye-bye.